Welcome back, geology fans. Each step we take is multiple millennia of deposition accumulating beneath our feet. We are approaching the trail section that crosses the local valley. It is not too surprising to find the cottonwoods here, as valleys supply much more water than ridges. The water being supplied is not visible on the surface, though, except rarely in very wet conditions, so it is most likely groundwater supply. We keep all of this in mind as we pause here to investigate an exposure of gravity-driven deposits we call colluvium. Alluvium is the term we use for stream-deposited sediments, and colluvium is the term for gravity-driven deposits. Colluvium, as seen here, tends to be less well-sorted and have more angular clasts than alluvium. The Denver Formation is alluvium and is much better sorted, though not that well sorted, and in case you missed it, the colluvium did not deposit contemporaneously with the Denver Formation. The Denver is the product of large-scale sediment deposition in the area, tens of millions of years ago, but this colluvium is deposition only on these local mesa flanks and comes from the erosional breakdown of this mesa. The large blocks appear to come from the cliff, forming layers up above. Though this colluvial comes at this point in our hike, it does not deposit until after these mountains have been fully built up and begin to break down. As a side note, there's a general rule in field geology called the rule of float. Perhaps the dumbest rule in all of geology. It says that if you find a loose piece of rock, it probably came from uphill. In the middle of this colluvium is a lens-shaped area that looks to be a significantly lighter color. A close examination shows that this light-colored material is a coating on the surfaces of the colluvium, and a hydrochloric acid test shows this to be mainly calcite. It is a microcrystalline calcite that is precipitated from the groundwater we know is pulsing through this area because of the cottonwoods surviving with ephemeral surface flow. In semi-arid locations, like that of Golden Valley, groundwater has the tendency in places to come to the surface and evaporate to the atmosphere, leaving all dissolved solids precipitated behind. Normal soils have water infiltrating downward, leaching the typical OAEC layers. This is how a K-soil horizon forms, from which desert hardpans develop. An incident in Texas from when I was young exemplifies how hard this material can be. Baby Jessica fell down a well in West Texas in 1987, and the nation's attention was fixed on this 18-month-old with a broken arm singing nursery rhymes to herself to keep calm for three days that it took to drill down just 22 feet to rescue her. It may surprise anyone to hear that it took that long to drill that distance in mere sedimentary rock, what is typically referred to as soft rock, until you realize it was almost completely calichified into hard pan. And caliche is a hard-as-brick material that has the strange property that it gets harder as you heat it which happens with standard rotational drill bits. So a new water-cutting technology had to be used instead of standard grinding drill bits to pull this poor girl out. If you find caliche in an area that is completely arid, well, it shouldn't have groundwater and you know it used to be wetter in a semi-arid state. Or if you find it in a moist environment, you know it would just have downward percolation of water and, well, there must have been drier in the past. Here we are already in a semi-arid environment and so feel this material has been deposited relatively recently in our current climate setting. While our attention is focused on more recent features, there is an interesting bit of human interference just upslope from the Caliche deposit. Here, a small dam has been built and a sediment catchment area was dug out behind it. When initially dug out, it became D-world with coarse material upslope and finer material downslope, and coarse on the bottom, fining upward. In fact, the grasses don't grow upslope because of the lack of nutrients delivered from coarse clasts. Uh, grasses only start to grow where silts and clays begin to deposit due to these smaller particles having much higher surface area and higher cation exchange capacity for nutrient exchange. After a period of deposition in this small basin, conditions turned and E-world began to dominate this microcosm. 
Channels cut down, leaving flat-topped mesas of material behind due to differential erosion. In this fractal world, this small-scale example is an analog to the flanks of the Rocky Mountains, which began as D-World, depositing the alluvial Denver Formation, but as we look around today, we see that E-World has taken over and cut down through these sediments, leaving features like our Table Mountains behind. And how beautiful it is.